Thank you all for joining uh, this Osteotho session today. And it's really great to be here with um, a group of people that I think are from very uh, different backgrounds, and especially to have people joining in from both the seafood and agriculture community, but also from the food systems community. Um, I will just very briefly introduce the session today before I hand over to Simon Bush, and Simon will present the article that we focus on today. Um, that article is a review of the developments in global aquaculture um, that was recently published in Nature. Um, it follows up on a similar review that was published 21 years ago. Um, and it, this recent article really takes the older review, I think, as a starting point to reflect on how aquaculture has developed and how it has grown as a sector over the past two decades and what this means from a sustainability perspective. I think a, a key finding uh, that I really look forward to discussing today is that over these two decades, um, aquaculture has really become much more integrated into the food system. Um, yeah, so we are very grateful to have three of the um, authors joining us here today. Um, and I've listed their names in, in bold on the slide here. So that is Simon, uh, who will present and lead the discussion. discussion. Um, and Simon is the chair of the Environmental Policy Group at Wageningen University in Research, and his research focuses on governance for sustainable seafood. Uh, also joining us is uh, Alejandro Bushman, uh, who is professor in seaweed ecology and aquaculture at the Universidad de Los Lagos in Chile, um, and David Little, who is professor in aquatic resource and development at the University of Stirling. Um, and I want to give a very warm welcome to you all. Um, yeah, so my next slide is the agenda, and this is all very straightforward, I think. So Simon will kick off with a, a five minute presentation of the findings of the research. And after that, the floor will be open for questions and comments. And then we'll use the final five minutes to wrap up. And the, in total, the event will take around 45 minutes. However, for everyone who wants to stay on the call for longer and discuss in a sort of more informal space, um, that's also possible afterwards. Um, then a note on housekeeping. Um, please be aware that this session will be recorded and that uh, we may share it on our website. Um, and for participants, please, if you want to speak, please raise your hand, uh, your virtual hand to indicate that. Um, I also want to highlight that the Q&A is open for questions and comments. And we try, we'll try to bring those questions into the discussion as well. Um, yeah, so that's really it for me. And with that, I want to hand over to Simon. Uh, we will give a brief presentation of the research. Thanks. Thanks, Walter. So let me take over the screen from you. Yes. Very good. Is it up already? Excellent. Yes. So thanks, Walter. And did I have the unenviable task of trying to summarize this uh, this paper, which is, uh, is is quite a substantial piece of work, a 20 year review uh, retrospective of, of global aquaculture in five minutes. It's an impossible task. So I'll just hit the headlines. And of course, I understand the format that we have a number of people who have really dived into the paper and that they'll ask a, a lot more questions to help us get the content out. You've already covered some of my presentation here eh, in terms of uh, you know, the authors and uh, who's here today, but let me just run through it again and give some context. Huh? Um, as you said, Walter, the, the paper is uh, a retrospective on a paper that was published uh, in, in 2000. Huh? So actually based on data from 1997, but published in 2000. And, and this paper published in 2021 really takes us from 1997 through to 2017. Uh, led by Ros Naylor at Stanford uh, and a, a list of other people you can see there on the screen. Um, some of the original authors uh, came back for this paper, um, and some of some of the authors, uh, myself included, uh, were new on this paper. Huh? So also seeing uh, some people persisting and then bringing in some, some new topics as well, huh? especially my area of governance wasn't covered, for example, in that first area. And you see some of the new things coming in with some of the new authors. And again today, myself, David Little and Alejandro Bushman are going to be available to answer your questions. So... I can change the slide. There we go. So, what's the you know, what, what what have we seen really in the last twenty years? Uh, for at least from nineteen ninety seven through two thousand seventeen, that's really at the core of this paper. And 
you know, it's really important to read this paper, I think, in the context of what the paper in 2000 was, was talking about. At that point, uh, sustainability was really focused on, well, the paper looked at sustainability of aquaculture broadly, but, but really with a, quite an emphasis on the use of wild fish in fish feed. Uh, so the conversion of fish caught in the sea to, uh, to aquaculture. Um, that was one of the major focuses. And another major focus was really on, on coastal and ocean areas. Uh, so it was really a marine aquaculture paper. And one could argue that there was also a little bit of a bias perhaps to uh, not only marine pr production, but pr production really from, uh, from more of a global north perspective. Uh, I think you could argue in some respects, either in terms of destination markets or indeed where the, where the production was occurring. Uh, what we've seen over the last 20 years, and that's really the high level sort of observation, is, is you know, it, it's, there's been a lot of growth in the sector. The growth of the sector has been phenomenal and in a few dimensions, right? So if you look at the graph on the right hand side there, uh, you know, you see a tripling of production from 1997 through to 2017. You see in that same uh, panel there, panel A, you see, you know, an enormous growth in, in the number of species are up to 425 species groups essentially making up aquaculture today. Uh, but what you see in panels uh, B and C is, is also part of that story, right? So B is really indicating that a very large proportion of the production globally is made up of, of three, three groups, huh? three categories, let's say, freshwater fish, algae, uh, and mollusks. Now, they're really making up the, the lion's share of, of production. And where we see uh, you know, the high trophic species, uh, not only are, but indeed crustaceans, diagermous fish, marine fish, uh, we see growth, huh? we see a high rate of growth, but overall, these aren't the species which are, which are dominating uh, the production of aquaculture. We see a huge variation beyond those species and species groups. So overall, enormous growth. And also, and this really gets down to the substantial part of the paper, um, some quite positive trends in, in terms of environmental performance over the last 20 years. Things have moved on from some of the statements, in other words, that were made 20 years ago. So what were some of the highlights? And again, I can't do justice to these, but I'll run through them. So the first is uh, you know, what we've turned in the paper, a hidden revolution of, of freshwater aquaculture. And what we're really saying here is that there's a number of paper, very large, uh, let's say, emphasis uh, leading on from the paper 20 years ago on marine production um, or coastal production, brackish water production. And what's really been essentially not as well covered or covered only really in, in, in recent years is really this, this focus on, on freshwater production. And there is a bias. In the, in the literature, you know, two thirds of the papers remain focused on mariculture or coastal aquaculture. Um, and it, but this sort of undermines, or let's say, doesn't represent the importance of freshwater systems, you know, providing 75% of edible production, you know, of edible production produced by aquaculture comes from these freshwater systems. That's a really important finding, I think. And it's not just the provision of food, it's also the contribution that these freshwater systems, uh, these production systems are contributing to uh, inland economies. Uh, and also contributing to uh, food provision for, for urban centres, large urban centres, largely in the global south. So, you know, this is a, a major oversight, but one we've really uh, emphasised uh, in this paper. And of course, there are environmental problems. And I think, uh, you know, an issue we've raised there also is that environmental issues around this freshwater system, just like the sector as a whole, have, have been given relatively little attention. There's a bit of a gap. Uh, another point we've raised in this, uh, in this review is the changing makeup of aquaculture feed. Huh? Going back to that first statement I said, there was a strong focus on, on feed in that paper from, uh, from 20 years ago, from 2000. Um, we revisited that uh, in this paper. And so the major sort of headlines there that we came with was, was really challenging, I think, uh, this sort of idea that's, uh, that we have a, you know, a, large, a large proportion, let's say a very dominant uh, notion that's, uh, that, that fish are being pulled out of the sea and put into aquaculture. We've, we've nuanced that, I think, to a substantial extent. Uh, so you know, the sort of broad lines are that we still see, of course, fed fish production has increased. It's in fact tripled over the last 20 years. Um, however, the, the forage fish catch, uh, the fish that's being taken out of, uh, of the oceans, let's say, and put into fish feed, that's declined by around a third. Uh, and what we also see is the share of fish meal and fish oil used in aquaculture. That's, that's indeed grown by a third, uh, the, the contribution to aquaculture, that's grown by a third. So aquaculture has actually taken a larger proportion of fish meal and fish oil overall. But 
if we look at the what we call the fish in fish out ratio that's declined essentially from 1.9 meaning 1.9 kilos of fish going into one kilo of fish produced you know, through aquaculture it's dropped from 1.9 in, in down to 0 0.28 so that's been a substantial gain let's say uh, in, in terms of the reduction of fish which has been used to produce fish meal and fish oil per unit of production within aquaculture as a whole. Uh, and what we also see is, is, is really the emergence of a whole range of alternative terrestrial plants and animal uh, proteins. And that's a really important point coming back to what Walter said earlier, because now we're seeing that it's not just a marine story, it's not just an a, a aquatic story, it's really integrating and understanding the connection of aquaculture through feeds partly, uh, moving from terrestrial, the links between the terrestrial and the aquatic environment. And that's, that's a really important, I think, finding we've, 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 uh, we've looked at uh, in this paper. Um, other points I'll run through a bit quicker, I think, you know, we, we focus on the unrealized uh, potential of low trophic species, especially seaweeds and mussels, recognizing they make up a huge volume. This was also in the paper in 2000, that was a large emphasis that there's this, let's say, underrealized potential of these species. Uh, we see that demand is, is remains skewed for food, huh? These how mussels, let's say, low trophic species are fitting into feed, food, human food is rather skewed in terms of demand, geographically skewed. Uh, but we also see other uses for these products are beyond food. So ecosystem services in some respects, in terms of water quality, there's a value to these species in, in that sense. But we also see new nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, even bioplastics, so new industries being, uh, let's say, extracted and, and developed on the basis of, of these production systems. Um, so that's that's one of the, the again, one of the key findings we've, we've come with. Um, and let me go to indeed what Walter said for time, right? This, aqua, this sort of overarching finding we have indeed is that aquaculture is, is again, not, not isolated within an aquatic environment. It's not located in any particular place of the world. It's, it's not just simple, able to be simplified in terms of, of, of issues around feed, for example. We really have to understand this in the broader sense of, of a global food system. Uh, and with that, it comes with a new understanding of the links between terrestrial and aquatic environments, as I've already said. It means we move beyond these rather simplified narratives of salmon and shrimp and the environmental ills of those production systems being representative of all aquaculture. Um, you know, it's really understanding that we have this variation of production systems and variation in the benefits that this, uh, that this, this whole sector provides. Uh, and moving forward, I think, this is the last slide. Whoops, too quick. The last slide is, is really, you know, what are going to be the challenges moving forwards and what are some of the pathways for continuing and to continuing to improve the sustainability and contribution of the sector to a global food system? Well, technology uh, is, of course, going to play a role in terms of production systems and feed. But what we also put a lot of emphasis on is the need for governance uh, and for governance to, you know, essentially move beyond uh, you know, private rulemaking and standard certification uh, and really try to transfer to and expand out to public private arrangements with a, with a, with a fo strong focus on site-based management, for example, and we can talk more about that later. Um, and also, I think above all, we've, we're putting emphasis on this idea that, you know, greater attention has to be given to the position of farmed fish, not in and of itself as an aquaculture sector, but also opening up to understanding the position of fish in a broader food basket. So there's much, much more to say. I've restricted myself as much as I could, Walter, um, but I'll leave it there and we'll open up for some discussion on, on those points I've raised and the many other points that I haven't been able to raise from the paper. Great. Thank you very much, Jess, and I uh, appreciate that. It's a hard task to summarize this in, in just a couple of minutes. But um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, the floor is now really open to questions from everyone, but um, I just, I may just, uh, start with a question I had, um, uh, which is basically about sort of the scope of the research and why you chose to specifically focus on on aquaculture. So I wonder, um, I guess you, I haven't looked into the FAO statistics, but I guess you would also see an increase in fishery, uh, like sea fishery production. Uh, so why did you choose to focus on aquaculture and its linkages to, to food systems? specifically. Um, and also just a, a note, uh, Simon, can you maybe stop sharing your screen so that yes. we can have a gallery view? Yes, of course. Sorry. Yeah, and I can see my co-authors there. So the question was, if I, if I understood correctly, was why did we focus on, on aquaculture and, 
in general terms, but then also in relation to or uh, to capture fisheries. I mean, I think put simply, I think the, the the focus of this review was in that retrospective sense, trying to revisit um, some of the the statements and, and findings of that uh, of that paper that came out in Nature. 20 years ago, right? And I think the, the, the panel or the authors are, the, the, the author list, the number of people working on it and the scope of issues that they've covered, uh, you know, we, we realized that the debates had moved on dramatically since that paper was published in 2000. And I think it's also fair to say that that was, uh, probably still remains a, a very highly cited paper um, on aquaculture. It's really used as a reference point for the state of aquaculture and was, was that for many years. People went to the, you know, the Naylor et al 2000 paper um, and, and, and look at the issues, looked at the issues around that paper. I'm not saying that was the only source, but it really set, I think, a discourse and it set uh, a series of questions uh, for, for subsequent research. And again, uh, looking at the, looked, even my two authors on the screen, uh, I think collect the three of us have, have, uh, have, have done research over the, you know, over that 20 years in, uh, to very extent to, to, and really saw that these issues weren't, uh, weren't, had moved on substantially. So this was really the goal of the paper. In terms of putting it in the context of fisheries, um, yeah, there were, I don't think there was any, there was, there was no real ambition to, to make a comparison with fisheries. I think the, the link there really is uh, going back to the Naylor paper from 2000 was, was really this link to, uh, to the use of marine uh, feed resources, let's say marine fish in, in aquaculture feed and to revisit and to see where, uh, what progress had been made. And, and then you start, then you can see the results that, are, that I've presented and that I've published in the paper. So I hope that gives a bit of a, a bit of a response. And of course, Dave and Alejandro, if you want to jump in, then um, by all means do. Um, George. Um, hi, Simon. Thanks very much for describing the paper. I very much enjoyed reading it. I have, I have two questions about the, um, the feed, the terrestrial feed products. One is a very specific one about um, byproducts, and you describe that um, how, the, how the, the byproducts of crops can be used for um, aquaculture feed. And I wonder if that, that's a sort of distinct set of byproducts that are also used for um, livestock. Um, you know, lots of claims made about. Uh, the efficiency of certain livestock uh, feed production things they can they, they can available the byproducts and is it just the same set of byproducts or is there a sort of tension there and and I guess the second question is is a, follows on from that and is about um, well we hear a lot about the food feed tension between crops being produced for human consumption or livestock feed and it is there an instance here in which there's a sort of feed feed tension? You know, should crops be being directed towards um, agriculture or livestock systems? And, and if if there is a tension, how do agriculture systems compare in greenhouse gas emissions efficiencies compared to things like poultry or, or pork or other sort of like high performing efficient livestock systems? There's a lot in that. I'm going to pass to Dave. He's got his finger up. He's jumping on this. So I'm going to pass to Dave first, and I'll come back and answer some of the other ones. Yep, Dave. Thanks, I don't have a bash. Um, f first thing about the byproducts of the crops. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on the system. Of course, things like rice bran are used competitively in, you know, for, for milk cows in the subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, or for pigs and chickens in Southeast Asia. So there's a direct competition often for that sort of product, broken rice, etc. cetera. Um, I think what we see though, that because the plant alternatives to marine ingredients, uh, particularly for high trophic species, your salmon, your marine fish, they, they, they don't do well on soy in the way that you can stuff down the throats of a pig or a, a poultry. So there's a lot more uh, value add, you know, gluten, um, and, uh, wheat gluten and, and corn, um, soy, 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 um, uh, processed soy forms that, that do much better in aquaculture. So, so in some ways, the the feed industries, I think, been uh, the, the aquaculture has been a bit of a vehicle for upskilling or, or, or upgrading how terrestrial feed ingredients are used because these these uh, in demand uh, high value fish tend to be much more uh, sensitive to some of these these uh, anti nutritional factors you get than the land animals. That's the first thing, um, and then you. you 
went on and talked about the the com competition between oh, and, and by the by we think around only four percent of global feed ingredients are going into aquaculture that's a figure by uh, that was in matt troll's paper some time ago so it's still relatively small but of course growing growing fast in line with the very fast growth of aquaculture um, this competition, yes, should we be eating soy ourselves or feeding fish? Well, that's it's the same argument. Uh, and of course, you know, European, for example, European salmon companies are very keen to reduce the amount of soy being used in salmon feeds, which is now at a very high level for all sorts of reasons, including, yeah, impacts on Brazilian uh, ecosystems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a there's a lot in there. Many of those arguments are the same. Yeah. I saw Alejandro with his finger up there, but he's disappeared from the screen. So I don't know what he wanted to add there. But I think maybe, George, coming back to your last point, huh? the sort of comparative studies on, on CO2 output, I think you were saying, our relative CO2 output or footprint can, with fish aquaculture versus other animal protein systems. Was that the question? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's not really just, is it better to eat for us to eat soy or to eat fish? It's more, is it better for us to eat fish or for us to eat, you know, chicken? Just by way of example. Oh, I forgot that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's various studies out there making this comparison. Huh? And, and so, I mean, the quick summary is that, yeah, it's certainly at the, the better end of the spectrum. Of course, then again, you've got to look at which aquaculture species, right? I mean, that, that's, I think, a really important, I think, coming from the paper again, right? This idea that aquaculture is one production system, um, we're illustrating that it's a broad range, right? So if, you, if you're taking... Um, you know, seaweed production that has, of course, an extremely different or even uh, or muscle production. I mean, there's even they've even uh, even been uh, movements to create um, carbon markets. Right. So climate emission markets essentially around uh, around these species. Right. So that's a very different picture um, to to some of the other aquaculture systems. But the general picture, if you're making the comparison in general terms and aquaculture falls out on the, the better end uh, somewhere, if I'm not wrong, Dave, right, the, the figures come out somewhere near chicken. Uh, and then pork and then beef uh, being, being at the, yeah. the other end. I was just looking at some of the figures this morning because one of my students was talking about it. there's there's a there's some reassessments coming out because the, the whole way life cycle assessments assessments mm. is done is actually very different, but you know, how you allocate boundaries, all that type of thing. And it's even massively different between fisheries and aquaculture very often. And also the persuasion of the people doing it, you know, do they take a more sort of strong sustainability stance or a weak sustainability stance. There's all sorts of issues there. But yeah, you're right. Simon's right. It, it's definitely at the lower end. The devil's in the detail. I mean, the Eat Lancet report, of course, just, just called it all seafood, which was, yeah. it was just, which was, you know, really not so good. And that's what's given forth, really, that was the stimulus for the Blue Food Assessment, which uh, the papers will be coming out this year, which should be a, a, a lot more... Yeah, on the on the money really, um, but but no, in general it looks good. You can you know you can reduce the overall impacts of diets by definitely verging towards some seafood choices, and you know there's some very good fishery choices and some very good aquaculture, and and vice versa. There are yeah. there are bigger impact uh, uh, both fishery and aquaculture choices as well. So the devil's in the detail. Can can we go to the next question? I think Heidi has a question also. Um, whenever you, the participants, whenever you ask a question, maybe very briefly in one sentence or half a sentence, say where are you calling from, what your background is. Hi, I'm Walter. Uh, as, as you know, I'm calling from California, in fact, just up the road from Roz Naylor. Um, uh, I'm in Pacific Grove, California right now, but I'm a student at the LSE and I was a former oceanographer. Um, and uh, I, I may ask you about, about something regarding Seafood Watch later, but uh, now I'm at the LSE studying behavioral science um, and how to shift us to more sustainable food consumption. So I'm super excited to see um, you covering this paper and it's a great marriage of, of two domains that really influence our, um, our biosphere and our planetary health and our human health, of course, right? And yet it seems like there's a, not a lot of discussion um, about, about the oceans or, or aquaculture. Um, I am biased, yes, um, towards marine sy systems being a former oceanographer, um, in, in food policy. So, so, so what can we do to make that connection more salient both for policymakers and for people, particularly those who might not live near the coast or near bodies of water? So I just, just, to, just to recap there, so the point is how to make 
the oceans or aquaculture? Well, to make that connection, you know, you, you talked about how in the paper about how that land sea connection was getting right. um, more salient because mostly of the feed, right? And yet we know that really um, <laughs> that, that the oceans and our food systems are linked in so many other ways. For instance, um, animal agriculture, a, a major driver of a number of uh, environmental problems, runoff, um, and definitely climate change, greenhouse gases, ocean acidification that are, are severely impacting the ocean. And really, it's, it's a, there's more of an interdependency there than I think most people realize. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good question. And it's a, it's a huge question as well. Huh? I mean, it reminds us of a, a paper Dave and I were on a few years ago where um, sort of really critiquing this notion that we can, uh, you know, we can eat our way to, to ocean sustainability, right? And, and really coming back to the idea that, you know, eating, eating sustainably leads to sustainable production systems doesn't necessarily mean that we're, we're able to save the oceans through that. And a lot of the NGO uh, seeing that broader governance context. Now, a lot of the sort of narratives that come out of NGOs is really, you know, if you eat sustainable seafood, you will be saving the ocean. So I think there's a bit of a, a, a bit of care we need to be taken, needs to be taken when we try to make those sort of broader links. Huh? This is the first thing that came to my mind. We bring it back to the paper. Yeah, absolutely. I'll pass on to Alejandro in a minute. But, uh, you know, I think if we, if we look at, uh, if we look at this link in the paper, yes, we're talking about feed. That's one of the links we're talking about, right, in terms of linking the land and the water. I'm going to put it in, in those terms. But I think we're talking more broadly as well. I mean, just recognizing the importance of freshwater aquaculture systems is also a means of reinterpreting and re-understanding the link between aquaculture aquatic systems and, and land-based systems, right? And if we start to understand that aquaculture plays an important role in the provision of food, right? And that the, in, indeed 75% of, of edible uh, protein produced through aquaculture comes from freshwater systems, then we're really talking about a, a whole policy domain which isn't focused on, on the ocean, in fact, right? We're talking about a policy domain which is integrated across landscapes, terrestrial landscapes. Um, and so I think just that that message in and of itself is a really important one that if we're talking about aquaculture, we're talking about aquaculture sustainability. Yes, the ocean is part of that story, but the bit we're really still, you know, we, we avoid in terms or have avoided, let's say, not only in sustainability terms, but just in terms of a provision of, of, nutri of, of human nutrition terms um, is really that, that, that terrestrial environment within which freshwater aquaculture is produced. That's an immediate response. And Alejandro wants to jump in here by the looks of things. So I'll pass on yeah. to you. Just, I think it's important to, to recognize that most of this phenomenon that you described at the few moments ago are interlinked, they are interacting. And I think in this paper, however, we are uh, pushing the idea that the development of aquaculture is not outside because it is it is a, a view a general view of the in the public you no know, that this you are doing this in the in the sea and the impacts are are in the sea and that is not the true no we are impacting other type of environments we are requiring resources to to this uh, activity. Uh, so the overall impact of this activity is also beyond the sea. And I think that is not always recognized and there are very few papers working on those things. Yeah. So would, you, how, would, you, would you suggest then that we need more academia focus on that or how do we get that into, I, I, I think- I think so we need more academia, perhaps, but we we need that the regulators also understand that these things are you cannot separate them. Exactly. Normally, things now you you are throwing, for example, chemicals or for for controlling pathogens and uh, parasites and so on, and you see, oh, okay, these are remaining in the sea, but we are start, starting to understand that this can come back. Even some of them can impact human health. Um, 
in a more complex ways that the, we understood. So we cannot separate it. And that is a message. We need more data, but we also need that the regulators understand the complexity of these systems. And the, normally, for example, in my country, these are in different ministry. They don't talk each other and there is no communication on, on these issues. I, and that think, is something that must be changed. I think we um, need to go to the next question because there's still so many people to ask. So juicy though, Walter, so juicy. We'll, we'll go <laughs> yeah. and we'll move on. Okay. So, uh, so I think, um, yes, yeah, sorry for that. But I think um, uh, Jennifer is next and then Sahil and then uh, Jafet. Oh, well, thank you. Um, thank you for the interesting paper. I found it, yeah, really insightful. Um, so I'm with Fish Welfare Initiative, which is an NGO, as the name already says, focused on um, the welfare of fish in aquaculture systems. Uh, so working with several stakeholders across the UK, India, and the Philippines to um, kind of move aquaculture systems towards higher welfare production to just unlock like the mutual benefits both for the fish, but also for the farmers with diseases, as you also mentioned in the paper, being a really big issue. So I'd just be curious to hear your opinion on, you know, like kind of like where agriculture stood in the last 20 years, because it wasn't really mentioned in the paper. And then also like looking forward, where do you think, like what place does um, welfare hold in like, Aqua, sorry, I said aqua, where agriculture stands. I mean, of course, where welfare stands within agriculture in the last 20 years, but also where it stands, like, you know, in the 20 years to come, like, you know, what kind of trends can we expect? And yeah, will it get more important? Because my understanding is that it, it hasn't fully arrived, I think, in like all of production across the world, um, which to us, of course, is a little concerning um, because it is so interlinked with other things. Um, that's one question. The other question I'd be really curious to hear your opinion on is with RAS systems specifically, whether you have any opinion about welfare in those systems, because I kind of see it go both ways, like you can provide really good welfare, but they're so technologically advanced that they're really prone to massive failure, right, where you have like really mass die offs too. So I'm like having a hard time telling, you know, it could RAS provide really good welfare or is it really risky at the same time, you know, like your thoughts on that too. Yeah. Dave Alejandro, you want to take the, the RAS system question, Dave? Uh, yeah, well, uh, you go ahead, this, Alejandro. Yeah, this is very personal because we still do not have enough data. Even I started with the uh, land-based systems and with circulation systems using filter feeders and mollusks to clean up the water. And so you can think many, in many areas you can have a better performance. But if you, you, might, if you go to RAS, you need to intensify your production. You need to have higher, densities of animals and so not all things goes in the same direction and uh, you may claim that uh, fish will be in a too high density and that is not going well to it's not the animal welfare good for animal welfare they will be stressed uh, and you depend on technology as you said, and technologies can also have failures. But um, okay, that, that is something that I think time needs to, to think about. And uh, I, actually I have serious doubts on, on where it will go. It, the other thing is that for RAS systems, you need a high value product. You cannot do it with a low value product. So if that starts to increase and that is the, the, the value of those products will go down, you will have a greater uh, 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 offer for the market. And I don't know how 
this will develop in the future. So I'm, I'm looking forward to see more information. Yeah. You want to add something to that, Dave? Um, just to your first point, Jennifer, about where do you see it sort of rolling out uh, globally? Yeah, you're right. I mean, we, you know, the, the attitudes towards, uh, towards improving welfare are, are, are highly variable across the world. What farmers want to do everywhere is make money. And, and so it's a question of can you link in the first instance to get any traction? It's looking for, you know, low hanging fruit. Where can you... Where can you look at getting the most welfare benefit with the greatest benefit that's an economic benefit to the producer? This is my view. Uh, producer stroke processor, because one of the key areas which people are focused on is slaughter of fish to improve welfare at that point. And I think there are other points in the value chain know to be around harvest, particularly from ponds, that you could probably do a lot to improve improve welfare at that point. So I think it's been strategic. I think it's learning lessons between countries. Uh, we had a European project where we got the, we told the salmon story to Asian shrimp, tilapia, pangasius producers. And once they stopped laughing at the whole idea and, and, and heard other farmers talking about more profits, they became more interested. So I think, uh, I think people were, you know, they're pragmatic and uh, it's part of the picture. It didn't feature in this paper incidentally, because you know, in a nature paper, half it gets cut out. Um, uh, you know, it's these things start big and they go back to the bare bones, really. It's a shame because I think it will become a much more important aspect of fish production, if only for the, the reasons you said, that health and welfare are intimately linked and yeah. everyone wants healthy stocks. I think maybe just to add one quick line, because I don't have to move on, Walter, but I mean, I think it's sort of governance of welfare too, right? So welfare sort of being picked up uh, as, as a key theme in a lot of, in some economies, let's say, right, in some markets. And uh, not the only way it's communicated and, and regulated, but, you know, certification, voluntary approaches have played a, a bit of a role there. And I think a lot of that sort of skewed geography of welfare issues also plays to the skewed geography of the effectiveness of those market-based systems as well. Um, so if you're really trying to mainstream make welfare uh, and you're trying to do it through the market, then, then we, we, you can almost predict, I think, we've seen it with certification, we see it with traceability. I think welfare um, is, is following the same sorts of patterns. If, again, that's the predominant way, I would argue, that it's being, uh, that it's being dealt with through the market. And if it gets more to a regulatory level, well, then I think that's also what the message of the paper is, right? Those sort of hybrid public-private approaches to issues like welfare are, are more likely to be successful in the future if... Uh, indeed, it, it gets raised as an issue to be taken up. Quick added, added point to that. But we, you know, there people are people. And I remember being in a workshop in Vietnam and, and one farmer, let's call him a positive deviant, said, my shrimp grow better when they're happy. So there you go. Make, I your, think, make your shrimp happy and they grow better. There was I a think farm we, in the Netherlands called the Happy Shrimp Farm a few years ago too, David. Failed miserably, unfortunately. Failed. Yeah. Failed. <laughs> Uh, let's let's discuss this further in the in the informal part. Of it. Um, so um, uh, I think that's the next question from uh, Sahil. Is that right? Or from otherwise? Okay, Dan from Jaffet. Um, and we only have like about four minutes left, I think, for questions. So just really try to be brief, and and we can move other questions to the informal part. So. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the paper. It's a good paper. Uh, I work for Hand in Hand Eastern Africa, uh, a member of a global network with presence in the UK, Kenya, uh, East Africa, and uh, India, and also Afghanistan. We're doing different types of projects, uh, mainly in agriculture, climate resilience, and also general entrepreneurship. Uh, but recently, we, we started venturing in circular economies and regenerative agriculture, uh, looking at this paper and the welfare of of, of aquatic life, uh, there is the threat of plastics. Uh, re research says that uh, we're releasing globally 150 million tons of plastic into the seas. And therefore, I don't know whether this is something that uh, uh, subsequent reviews of this paper could address because uh, it's a, kind, a lot affecting the, the quality and even the life of uh, aquatic animals. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I, I know this is kind of affecting uh, food safety and also the quantity of food that, that is, is going to be available from, 
uh, from the seas in the future. So that's something that uh, needs to be looked at. And I, uh, uh, also what somebody said about uh, what you are doing on land, the types of farming, we do a lot on crops and livestock. But again, the way we are doing it is also affecting aquatic life, especially on the chemicals and the other substances that we are releasing into water. So my main point here is about how do we address the question of plastic going forward? Uh, and if this can be addressed in the subsequent reviews of this paper. Thank you. Nice, uh, nice question, Jabeth. Can Alejandro or Dave, have you got anything to add here on the point of plastics? I think there's a few points you raised oh, there, Jabeth. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it, I don't know if I have the right answer for how to control in plastic now, but uh, uh, it's, it's a problem that has different aspects to be covered. And I'm not an expert on that, but coming into the food chain, yeah, it will affect uh, aquaculture. It can affect, especially in places where you have inputs coming from rivers and so on that accumulates plastics and are bringing it, it's a continuous flow of plastic coming into these sites. Uh, at this moment, uh, finding good sites for aquaculture is one of the major points. And I think you need to be in a clean site because Plastic is what something that you are seeing, but in the same water, there are so many other things uh, that are also affecting your production and, and your the food quality uh, that you need to, to take care about. Yeah. And that is something that uh, we need to, to be uh, taking into account. How to reduce plastic use that is yeah. far beyond my my capacities right now no it's i agree we're not we're not going to answer it here but maybe maybe just to, just to twist it around a little bit to your pets and also to refer back to the blue food assessment that's uh that's ongoing and papers will come out this year you know one of those papers i think quite interesting i think there are two papers coming out you know one is looking at the impact of aquaculture on the environment which has been a very strong narrative also going back to the paper from you know two decades ago uh, that was that sort of narrative of aquaculture has an impact like all food systems we have to understand food production systems we have to understand that but i think interesting that what you're talking about the narrative shifting also to what are the impacts on aquaculture right what are the sort of what are things like plastic things like water quality that has an effect on aquaculture and that's an important new let's say way of thinking about things because of and giving recognition to um, you know the role that aquaculture plays within within that global food system right in contributing um, you know in many cases uh, you know a, a promising source of, of animal protein so I think that's also an important set of questions which are, are sort of shifted the discourse away from just impact of aquaculture on the environment to understanding these broad range of uh, let's say vulnerabilities of aquaculture um, that they face with that aquaculture faces within within its environment wherever that environment might be and that that's something we did refer to if not specifically to plastics uh, within this paper and it's being picked up more and more good um, we're gonna run slightly over time but I think um, I want to give space for uh, last questions from Helen and from uh, Jeremy and maybe Simon you could uh, like we Helen or Jeremy you could ask her questions first and then respond to them together and then also Simon use that um, as for your final reflections on this and then I will wrap up. Yes, so, so over to you Helen, yes. My question is actually on behalf of SLU Professor of Aquaculture Anders Kiesling because he couldn't attend today. Um, Anders appreciates the paper's overview of how aquaculture can become a global contributor to sustainably produced food as long as the right political and industry decisions are made. And he asks whether you can reflect on how these necessary changes at the global level can be adapted for decision makers in varying local contexts. Uh, for example, if different places have different ecosystems or different levels of access to relevant resources. And Jeremy? 
Thanks. So um, my question is about governance gaps, I guess, because um, we talked. You talked a little bit earlier about, I guess, how certifications for issues and regulation for issues like animal welfare is quite uneven globally. I was really interested to see in the paper there was a little section discussing um, consumer guides and ratings for seafood. So my question was kind of, does that I guess, cover some of the gaps and enable kind of a more global view, or does it just replicate the gaps and the unevenness in certification and regulation, basically? Good questions. To, yeah, how long have we got for this, Walter? <laughs> um, yeah, let me let me try have a go uh, quickly. I mean, I think uh, the first one in terms of, you know, global messaging and, and issues, let's say, how can that be translated into uh, to local action? And I think that goes, actually, it's probably related quite nicely to Jeremy's as well, in a way, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about global issues, but what we're saying in the paper, I think, interestingly, is that I'm making it very general here, huh? but the sort of very generalised understandings of aquaculture don't hold everywhere, right? And again, sort of what we're highlighting going back to the paper is that there has been, I think, what we're trying to do in the paper also is, is really much illustrate that, that we can't make certain global assumptions around aquaculture having these impacts, Right. That we have to understand and putting it in your terms helen or the person you're asking the question for terms um, that requires seeing the variation right of the different species where those species are grown in which sites i mentioned this in the presentation as well moving much more to a site-based or there's various terms for it area-based bay management all these sorts of approaches which really give it which give a lot more attention to the position of aquaculture within its environment what I think is, is, is probably less, uh, less clear at this point is really understanding that, that, let's say, the social context within which aquaculture is produced. There's more and more work on that, don't get me wrong. Um, but when we're talking about really area-based, you know, it is important, I think, in the future that we really see this as a socio-ecological uh, understanding of how aquaculture is, is positioned in a particular place. But the macro sort of understanding of everything should be extrapolated from shrimp and salmon, which I'm making a bit of a generalisation, but, but that happens a lot in certain films that have just been released recently as well, um, then, you know, we need to move beyond those, right? So that's my quick response there. Um, and Jeremy, I would say, yeah, that's an interesting question. And there was a short area of focus on consumer guides and certification and, and governance in general. That was also cut by half, I think, in the last day of, the, of our writing process. Um, but really, the, the message there is what you point out in the second hand, I think, right? That um, if I understood the question correctly, you know, that is this, is, are, these, are these guides, consumer guides and certification systems a approach or perhaps the approach to address sort of global sustainability in, in, in aquaculture? Or is it replicating, let's say, you know, certain patterns of understanding how aquaculture is, has developed and where their sustainability issues are? I think in, in many ways, the second, right? I mean, if we look at freshwater systems, um, you know, you can look at tilapia, you can look at pangasius, but you know the vast majority of, of, of these freshwater systems aren't really covered in these uh, in these in these guides and certification systems because a lot of them aren't extending beyond national borders. I mean, you know, again, something that Dave and I did recently with a colleague Ben Belton. You know, if we look at the top ten aquaculture producers around the world, um, you know, ninety percent of the production that they that coming out of their, their their aquaculture systems doesn't cross an international border, right? So ninety percent of aquaculture in those countries is for domestic markets. Where there isn't at this stage, you know, a large demand for um, for certified product, and that's a that's a finding of the paper as well. Huh? So be a little bit careful around, you know, what sort of mechanisms in terms of governance are working for which markets, um, and again, that there's no global solution to to global aquaculture problems. We have to look at mechanisms in governance terms um, in the context of bring it back to Helen's question in the context of of markets. If we're talking about welfare, if we're talking about sustainability. If we're talking about nutritional needs, the same thing holds. We need to understand, you know, what are the triggers, what are the mechanisms that are going to be effective in driving a system or a, a sector to sustainability in that context. So that's my very quick answer because I'm scared of time. Dave and Alejandro, do you want to add anything to that? I think you say it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Dave won't think I said it perfectly. No, that, that's fine. I okay. think that's a good answer. There's a, there was something in, in the discussion um, in the Q&A on uh, whether or not we can translate the best practices of environmental governance from aquaculture to other areas of the food system. And I think there are specifics around, around water-based systems. You know, you could only think of, of water quality. These are things that are absolutely critical to, to um, maintaining high quality uh, 
production and performance of, of, of farmed uh, aquatic animals. But there's lots of others that, that track across very well. You know, what about, you know, the efficiency of resource use? What about impacts on near environments? What about using life cycle assessments as a, a way of comparing systems a, across time and space, if, if you were? And these, these are now being used routinely to compare, not just within aquaculture, but between aquaculture and other food categories. I hope that helps. I think we are really just scratching the surface of, of the article even in this in this session. Um, but we are already running out of time. So thank you very, very much, uh, Simon, Alejandro and David. Um, and yeah, so this brings us to the end of the formal part of the session. Uh, and I think it really shows again how relevant it is for the food systems and the aquaculture community to, to engage much more with one and another. Um, yeah, so um, on the uh, on these events, if you have any feedback for uh, how we run these events or suggestions for future sessions, please let me or one of my colleagues know. Um, and also want to very, very quickly promote uh, our newsletter folder and the podcast feed that we launched recently. I think both are great ways to uh, stay up to date about the work that we do at Table. Uh, and I think my colleague Matthew will post a few links in the chat uh, where you can subscribe. Um, yeah, I just want to say thanks again for, for Simon, Alejandro and David and everyone's input today. Um, and we'll now have a very short one minute break to give people who want to leave the chance to do that. Uh, and then we'll just continue the discussion in a more informal way because I think there's just so much more to discuss.